Hello, I'm Dr. Allison Guimera. I'm one of the UCLA pediatricians and I practice at the Porter Ranch office. Today, I'm excited to talk to you about parenting for the second time. I'll be offering some updated advice for grandparents. September 8th is Grandparents Day and what a better time to talk about the role of grandparents in the care for children than now. Now this talk is going to be focused on grandparents who may not be able to go to the pediatrician's office with their grandchildren, but the advice in this lecture is going to cover things that may be applicable to parents, nannies, or really anyone who's involved in the care of children. I'll remind you to ask questions during my talk on Twitter using the hashtag UCLAMDChat, or you can comment directly in the YouTube window. I'm going to give you a brief overview of what I'll be talking about today. I'm going to talk about the role of grandparents in the care of grandchildren nationally. And then I'm going to go into some new guidelines on feeding, sleep, and general safety. Then I'm going to give some tips for safely treating and preventing illness. And then talk about how grandparents can keep kids engaged and teach them some new skills. Some of the questions that I will address during this talk include, when can a child safely start eating peanut products? When can an infant safely drink water? Can an infant safely sleep on their belly? What age can a child face forward in a car seat? And what medications are safe to give to sick or teething children? So, we know that grandparents provide care for, for their grandchildren, some on a temporary basis, some on a daily basis, and some grandparents are actually the legal guardians for their grandchildren. So millions of grandparents across the United States are lovingly serving as caregivers to their grandchildren. About one in four children under the age of five is cared for by their grandparents. And that number is a little bit higher if the mother works outside the home. So why do grandparents care for their grandchildren? Far and away, the number one reason is because they say they want to and they enjoy doing it. Other reasons include financial reasons, so, so that the parents can work or so that the family can save money on daycare. Uh, there are many other reasons why grandparents provide care to their grandchildren. Some is because they're a legal guardian. Um, some is to pass down family values. Um, and some is, say, to help out a single parent. Now, if you are a grandparent and you're caring for a young child, you may not be up to date on the evolving advice. So professional organizations are continually updating advice on how to care for children and how to keep them safe. Some of the advice that has changed in the last three to five years include um, recommendations on peanut introduction, recommendations on child passenger safety in the car, and recommendations on safe sleep. I'm going to start by talking about nutrition. This is such a wide topic and I get a lot of questions in the office, both from parents and grandparents, about what and how much and when to feed children things. I'm gonna start by talking about peanut introduction because this is something that grandparents may not be fully up to date with. The peanut introduction trends have swung completely in the opposite direction over the last 10 to 20 years. And more recently, there has been a change based on a 2015 study called the LEAP study. The LEAP study is the learning early about peanut allergy study. And this trial showed that infants who are high risk for peanut allergy actually reduced their risk of severe peanut allergy by 81% when they were introduced peanuts early in life compared to the same kids who avoided peanuts for up to five years. Now, the peanut introduction trends have changed, and I'm gonna go through those with you right now. 
So in 2000, the AAP, which is the American Academy of Pediatrics, recommended that high-risk children, so children who are at risk for severe food allergies, avoid all peanut products until they're three years old. Then in 2008, um, a physician by the name of Dr. Lax published his study in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. This study published findings that um, the prevalence of peanut allergy in Jewish children in Britain was much higher than the same co cohort of Jewish children in Israel. And he purported that this is because in is Israel, there is a traditional peanut snack that is fed to young children. In 2010, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease changed their guidelines to recommend feeding infants solid foods and allergenic foods between four and six months. While these recommendations changed, a lot of pediatricians did not change their recommendations for food introduction and were continuing to, to follow the AAP recommendations. Then in 2015, that groundbreaking LEAP study that showed an 80% reduction in severe peanut allergy with early peanut introduction came along. And in 2017, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease changed their guidelines in support of early peanut introduction. Now I'm gonna go over those guidelines with you right now. And I, I want to remind you to always consult your child or grandchild's pediatrician for individualized advice. Um, I'm just gonna give you some of the general advice. So in general, children with severe eczema or who have egg allergy are at high risk for peanut allergy. And those children should consider allergy testing and based on the testing results, introduce peanut containing foods between four and six months of age. So very early peanut introduction. Children with mild to moderate eczema, they may introduce peanut containing foods around six months of age. And children who are very low risk for food allergy, who don't have eczema or any other food allergies, they may introduce peanuts per the family preference. So there's no specific timeline for that. Now I'm gonna talk about fluid nutrition. How much should my baby be drinking? When should I introduce water? Things like that. So in the first year of life, between zero and six months, fluids are the major source of calories and nutrition. You should offer breast milk or infant formula to your grandchild, and water should be avoided in children under six months of age. Between six and 12 months, breast milk or formula should be continued, and water may be introduced in small amounts, between four and six ounces per day. Fruit juices and sodas should be avoided under one year of age. At 12 months of age, we often recommend considering offering fortified cow's milk. And in general, formula is no longer necessary unless there are medical indications for continuing formula. After a year, you should continue to offer water and breast milk as desired. And juice should be limited if offered at all. And drinks with extra added sweeteners like soda, chocolate or strawberry milk, fruit juices should try to be avoided completely. These, these drinks have lots of sugar and can increase the risk for overweight and obesity. Now I'm gonna talk about some foods to avoid, including honey and choking hazards. Honey should not be given to children under 12 months of age, as honey can lead to a serious poisoning called botulism, and botulism causes paralysis. All honey should be avoided in children under 12 months of age. That includes yogurt with honey, Honey Nut Cheerios, or graham crackers with honey in them as well. I'm gonna review some choking hazards. So um, young children, toddlers, and children under the age of five are at the highest risk for choking. 
Things that are round tend to be a uh, high risk for choking. So things like grape tomatoes, cherries, grapes, those things should be cut into much smaller pieces. So at least halves or quarters um, before giving them to toddlers. Other things that can be choked on are pieces of hard raw fruit or vegetables. Nuts and seeds tend to be high risk for choking and should not be offered to toddlers. And round slices of hot dog. So if you cut the hot dog in a circle, um, that is the perfect shape of the airway and it can be choked on. If you're going to offer hot dogs and sausages, cutting them lengthwise as opposed to in circles tends to decrease the risk of choking. Tough meat and uncooked dry fruit are also choking hazards. So often raisins are thought of as great healthy snacks, which they are, um, but they can be dangerous for young toddlers. And then at grandma's house, there's always candy or gum or some, some sweet treats. Um, if you are offering younger children candy, avoid the candies that are hard and round. Even things like M&Ms can be choking hazards. So some choking prevention tips. Um, again, as I said, choking um, is highest for children under the age of five. The best way to prevent choking is to offer close supervision to your grandchild while they're eating and have them eat sitting up in a supported chair, either a high chair or a booster seat or a chair at the table if it fits them well. You should avoid feeding your child or grandchild in the car, stroller, or while walking around. At, during these times, children are not focusing on eating, they're focusing on other things, and they may get very excited and accidentally um, suck in a piece of food. And then continue to offer developmentally appropriate foods. For instance, avoiding tough meats when kids don't have um, molars in yet. Next, I'm going to talk about healthy eating habits. So we as pediatricians always talk about healthy eating habits, and this is something that can be continued in grandparents' homes as well. Although grandparents love to spoil their kids with cake and cookie and candy and treats, it, it can also be your job to model healthy eating habits. So I recommend that grandparents offer healthy food and beverages, including water, fresh fruits and vegetables, and low calorie snacks. It's important to keep healthy foods in the uh, eyesight of kids, so either out on the table or as you open the refrigerator, right in the front. If the first thing that they see in the refrigerator is chocolate milk, that's probably what they're going to be asking for. But if the first thing they see in the refrigerator is a bowl full of strawberries, that's what they're going to gravitate towards. And as a, as a guideline, children should eat five or more fruits or vegetables every day. And those foods with extra added sugars um, and who are, who are high in calories, um, these are foods that should be avoided or given in very limited qu quantities. So that would be sugar sweetened beverages, high calorie snacks and sweets, high sugar cereals. And when these, these foods are sometimes bought for celebrations, so cake for a birthday party or a 4th of July celebration, um, once the celebration is over, those high calorie foods should be removed from the home and they shouldn't be eaten over the next month. Now I'm gonna transition and talk about some safe sleep recommendations. In 2016, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with uh, revised uh, safe sleep recommendations. And their recommendations are to help prevent what we call SIDS, which is Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. And um, sudden infant death uh, can be caused by suffocation, asphyxia, or entrapment in the sleep space itself. But it can also be caused by infections, ingestions, metabolic diseases that the child may have, or other heart conditions or trauma. 
So the AAP Safe Sleep Guidelines are aimed at decreasing the infant's risk for sleep-related death. And when we're talking about infants here, we're talking about uh, children who are under the age of one year old. So the number one guideline in this, uh, in this document that the AAP put out um, emphasizes back to sleep. So infants should be placed on their back for every sleep up until one year of age. Side sleeping and propped sleeping on the side are not safe and they are not recommended. And back sleeping does not increase the risk of choking even in children with severe reflux. Um, all children have a protective airway mechanism that can help protect them if they are having reflux symptoms. And then once an infant can safely roll from their back to their belly and their belly to their back, um, we still recommend putting them down in the crib on their back. Uh, but then if they assume the belly position, they can be allowed to stay in that position. Now I'm gonna talk about the sleeping environment. So infants should sleep on a firm, flat surface most infant mattresses um, and infant uh, pack and plays, things like that, um, are firm and flat. The mattresses should hold their shape. So if you put your hand down on the mattress, it should not sink in or make a handprint in the mattress. Most adult mattresses are not firm enough. And then when you put the mattress inside the crib, it should fit tightly in the crib without any gaps where the child could become entrapped. Pillows and loose blankets should not be used inside the sleeping space or as a replacement for a firm flat mattress. Uh, sleeping sacks are a great alternative to blankets. Um, those are blankets that kids can wear and they zip into them. This, is, uh, this helps to prevent loose bedding in the crib with them. Bumper pads should not be used. Uh, they increase the risk for suffocation, strangulation, and entrapment. And infants should not be sleeping in places like car seats, strollers, swings, or infant loungers. Um, these places are not considered safe sleep environment for the children. So if uh, you're out driving with your grandchild and you bring them in in an infant carrier, they should be removed from the carrier once you get into the home and placed on a firm flat mattress. Another thing to remember about safe sleep is to avoid overheating. Studies have suggested that uh, the SIDS risk is increased in babies who are overheating. Infants should not wear more than one layer of clothing than an adult would wear. So if you are comfortable in a t-shirt and shorts, the infant may wear t-shirt, shorts, and a sleeping sack on top. Avoid overbundling and blankets that are up near the face. And then monitor infants for signs of overheating. So sweating on the forehead, flushing of the face, or the body and core feeling very warm. I'm gonna transition now and talk a little bit about safety and how you can keep children safe in your home. So first, we're gonna talk about car safety. So there's some updated recommendations on um, car seats and child restraints. Um, infants and toddlers should ride rear facing in the car until they outgrow um, the car seat and they reach the highest weight or height permitted by the car seat manufacturer. So this is height and weight based, not age based. So um, previously some were recommending switching babies uh, forward facing at a year. Um, now that has changed to closer to two years, but infants can, and children can ride safely well beyond two years if you're going by the highest weight or height permitted by the car seat manufacturer. Once a child has outgrown the rear facing car seat, um, then they may switch to a forward facing car seat and remain in that five point harness as long as possible 
again, up to the height and weight as um, determined by the car seat manufacturer. After, after transitioning out of a car seat, uh, kids typically will transition to a booster seat. Um, and I recommend that they use a belt positioning booster seat in the vehicle um, until the shoulder belt fits properly. And that's typically around a height of four foot nine inches. And when children are between eight and 12 years of age. You can use the following questions to determine if your child fits properly in the back seat of the car without a booster seat. So one, is the child tall enough to sit against the back of the vehicle seat with her knees bent at the edge of the vehicle seat without slouching and able to stay in this position comfortably throughout the duration of the ride? Then, does the shoulder belt lie across the middle of the chest and shoulder and not over the neck or face? And finally, is the lap belt low and tight along the hips and pelvis? If the answer to all three of these questions is yes, then the child may ride without a booster seat. All children who are younger than 13 years of age should always ride in the rear of the car. Um, the airbags in the front of the car are dangerous for children who are less than 13. And so this is the reason why, why children should ride in the back seat of the car. I'm gonna talk a little bit about safety in the home. I wanted to be sure that you all are still listening. Um, and I have this hearing aid up here because um, I'm gonna talk in a few minutes about a danger that can be with adult hearing aids. So some dangers in the home are medications that are not secured, so including um, bottles that may be in your purse or pill packages that have already been set out for the week. You should look around your house and in areas where children might grab and be sure that all medication um, is secured. Um, cleaning products can be dangerous for children, especially the newer cleaning products, uh, the detergent pods that can be used in the dishwasher and the laundry machine. Uh, those often look like candy and um, can cause very, um, very dangerous ingestions. So button batteries. Button batteries are those small round batteries that we find um, in devices like remote controls. Uh, they are found in hearing aids. They can be found in watches. So those things may not seem to be dangerous if a child is playing with, say, the remote control for the TV or found grandpa's hearing aid, um, but they can be dangerous if the child is able to get the button battery out. Pools in your home can be dangerous, so I would recommend that they are fenced in and secured and you have a plan for watching the children closely if you have a pool at your house. Also, um, grandparents may have animals that are not used to small children. Um, so thinking about separating animals or um, not letting children play with, with uh, small animals who aren't friendly to avoid fights. Now I'm gonna talk about illness in grandchildren. So it's important for grandparents to have all the stuff in their house that they would need to um, know if the child is sick. And one of those things is a digital thermometer. For the very young infants, a, a digital thermometer to measure a rectal temperature is preferred. Older kids can use an oral digital thermometer or one under the arm. I also recommend that grandparents know the office policies of their pediatrician, um, of the grandchild's pediatrician. Some offices require signed release forms from the legal guardian so that other people can bring them in and consent for medical treatment. Some medications that you may want to have on hand in your home are Tylenol and Ibuprofen, as these can be safely given for fever or pain. 
Ibuprofen shouldn't be given to children younger than six months of age. And it's important if uh, the child is in your home during the day and with the parents in the evening that you write down times and doses of medications that you're giving so so to avoid overdosing of medication over-the-counter cough and cold medication like robitussin and dimetab tend to be dangerous for children under the age of five in addition, aspirin should not be given to any child unless directed by a physician. Teething gels and teething tablets can also be dangerous. Those contain benzocaine, belladonna, or similar products, which can, be, um, which can cause significant neurologic changes. Now we've gotten through all of the guidelines and recommendations. Now's the time to talk about how great grandparents are and what the benefits um, they can provide to children. So grandparents should, you know, their, they should share their love and passions with their grandchildren. Things and activities like cooking and knitting and gardening and crafting, things that, that kids can learn from their grandparents doing hands-on activity, this is the, the greatest thing that a grandparent can give to their grandchildren. I also recommend that grandparents share their languages, their traditions, whether that's food traditions or, um, or other things with their grandchildren. And I recommend that you spend time with them disconnected from TV and media and look to do things more like reading with them. And as a reminder, the best gifts you can give to your grandchildren are time and attention. So some of my take home points from today are that grandparents play a very important role in the care of children from occasional to full-time care particularly when children are too young to be in school. I recommend that you feed your grandchildren healthy foods, avoid choking hazards, and honey under one year of age. You should try to create a safe sleeping space for babies if you're having them sleep in your home. And when riding with your grandchild in the car, be sure that they are properly restrained. Search your home for potential dangers but most of all, have fun caring for your grandchildren. These are some of the resources that I used for my talk today. Um, and I'd invite you to ask more questions on Twitter using the hashtag UCLAMDChat. Oh, I, I, I hear that we already have a couple questions. So I'm gonna go forward with the first one. The first one reads, um, my daughter is expecting a baby and has asked me to find out if I'm up to date with my Tdap. How do I know if I'm up to date and why is this important? This is a great question. So Tdap is a vaccination and uh, it protects against tetanus, diphtheria and pertussis and pertussis is whooping cough. Um, so we're, a we're asking caregivers, both parents and grandparents who are going to be in close contact with new infants to be updated with their Tdap. That means having had it within the last five years um, because of the risk of pertussis for young children. And pertussis is whooping cough and it can cause significant problems if an infant contracts whooping cough. So the best way to protect infants is to cocoon them and to make sure that everyone around them is immunized and protected against it. The next one is, I have a very active toddler grandson. Can you re recommend activities for us to do outside the home to keep him active? This is a great question. Um, Obviously taking the, the child out of the house and having him do things that explore his, his motor skills. So going to the park, uh, a lot of communities or YMCA's have mommy and me classes, but that's not uh, specific just to parents. A lot of grandparents take their grandkids to mommy and me classes or play gyms or things like that. So I would recommend exploring some of those options in your local community.